I didn't really like the work that we were doing or the faculty or the other kids in the program. Welcome to the third episode of Art Design Music. I'm your host, graphic designer and illustrator Judd Haynes, and this podcast focuses on visual artists that create work for the music industry. Video directors, photographers, graphic designers, illustrators, and today we'll be chatting gig posters with one of the industry's biggest names, Jay Ryan, the bird machine himself. But first, let me take care of a little bit of housekeeping. This season of the show will consist of 11 episodes. The first 10 feature conversations with many of my art heroes who make work for the music industry. But we turn the focus over to our listeners for the 11th episode, which is going to be a fun one. If you have a question for any of our guests, this is your chance to have them heard. I asked each one if they'd be willing to come back on to answer a question or two, and they all said yes. How fun is that? Come on, get your questions in. Record yourself asking your question or type it in an email and send it along to artdesignmusicpodcast at gmail.com, and we'll do our best to get you some answers. On the same token, if you want to comment on the podcast, send us a show suggestion, have a favorite album cover, tour poster, or music video that you'd like to tell us about, please send those along too. We'll read a bunch of those emails on episode 11, so this is your chance to be on the show. Again, we'd love to hear from you. The email is artdesignmusicpodcast at gmail.com. We're giving away a little something something each episode. So each person who sends in a question, comment, or show suggestion will go in a draw for those prizes. Of course, I'm supposed to tell everyone to please subscribe wherever you get your podcast, as we want to make sure you have access to every new episode as soon as it comes out. We're on Facebook and Instagram at Art Design Music Podcast and hope you'll give us a follow as we're posting all sorts of fun content there. Plus, if you're following either of those pages, then you're also entered for each of our giveaways. All winners for the season will be announced on episode 11. That's weird that you <laughs> know that. As I'm sure you can understand, it's a little weird making an audio only podcast about visual art. So we've gone overboard with the show notes, like really overboard. Where possible, we have found and posted visual examples of every item or project discussed in today's episode. Find that over on our website at artdesignmusic.com. Just click Episodes and find J. Ryan. Totally get it if you're out walking the dog or driving right now and your computer just isn't handy. But if you are sitting at home and the iPad is right next to you, pop open the website and check out those show notes as I'm sure you'll enjoy following along. So let's dive in. Once again, I'm Judd Haynes, a graphic designer and illustrator from Newfoundland, Canada. If you're curious about my work, you can find me at juddhaynes.com. That's J-U-D-H-A-Y-N-E-S.com. And on Instagram, I'm at Mighty Pops, M-I-G-H-T-Y-P-O-P-S. All right, all that out of the way, let's get to today's show. The butt is not like central to the theme of the image. At this point, I'm just a sad, used pile of dad jokes. I know my way around uh, messing up somebody's record. If you're anything like me, your walls are probably covered with posters from your favorite bands. Hand screen printed band posters have become highly collectible as more and more visual artists push the limits of what's possible with centuries old screen printing practices. With album sales not being what they once were, many fans now line up at the merch table to buy a poster commemorating their favorite night out seeing their favorite band. In my opinion, no one is more responsible for this resurgence in concert posters than Jay Ryan. His unique visual voice set him apart almost immediately. His work has always been colorful and playful, hilarious, and sometimes even a tad absurd. Folks have fallen in love with his illustration style and the heart that comes through in every poster. You can tell that this is work that comes from an artist who loves their job. And while my posters don't look anything like his, I can absolutely count myself among the ranks of poster designers all over the world who would not be doing what they do had it not been for the mighty Jay Ryan. I want to start off by saying, first off, Jay, that I'm a fan. I've uh, got three of your prints here in my house. Oh, man. And long back before the gig, gig poster days, like the gigposter.com days, uh, rest in peace, gig posters. Uh, you were the first poster artist that I knew by name. It was like, I remember seeing your posters 
online and uh and it was kind of the first time i'd seen posters that i i totally resonated with because so much before that was just kind of showing things that i wasn't necessarily interested in but yours immediately jumped out to me and i've been kind of following you ever since oh thank you i'm sorry about that (laughs) (laughs) i've read a bunch of interviews with other artists um over the years and i've noticed that there's so many of them end up citing you as either a a big influence on them now or a big reason why they even got into this in the first place And so I know you're super busy and I want to thank you so much for taking the time to chat today. Oh, well, thank you for having me. This is great. Any chance to talk to a Canadian is a welcome one. Before we dive into the work, I want to quickly just set the stage for any listeners who might not be aware of your backstory or your origin story. Uh, So where do you live and work? So I live in Evanston, which is the next town immediately adjacent to Chicago on the north side, jammed up against Lake Michigan. Immediately west of there is a little town called Skokie, which is where I'm sitting right now in the Bird Machine, which is my print shop. Uh, I grew up in the area and uh, lived in Illinois for most of my life and uh, grew up with a lot of family around. And I, right now where I'm sitting, I'm about maybe 10 miles from my childhood home, but uh, just a couple miles from where we live. And when you went to post-secondary school, yeah. was illustrating posters something you wanted to do at that time? I had no idea that this even existed at that point. I went through high school thinking I wanted to be an architect and uh, applied to schools for the architecture programs at a couple of different schools, but ended up going to our big state school, University of Illinois in Champaign, which is about 150 miles south of Chicago. Um, did not make it into the architecture program there, so I ended up going into the art and design program there and starting in industrial design. I didn't really like the work that we were doing or the faculty or the other kids in the program. So I, (laughs) there was a cute girl in the painting program. So I changed to painting and uh, finished up with a degree in painting. And was that cute girl, Diana? It actually, yeah, it actually was. So yay. yay, Good guess. Uh, (laughs) Yeah, so uh, tricked her into asking me on a date, and and uh, we've been together now for a long time. So when you finished school, then you learned screen printing from Steve Walters. That's correct. He's a great guy. He's uh, he's here in Chicago. Let's see. I got out of school and kind of stumbled through a couple of different jobs working with wood. I was building houses. I was doing cabinetry, uh, booking bands at a bar. Uh, working in the warehouse at Touch and Go Records. Um, this whole time, though, I was playing music uh, first in a band called Hubcap, and then uh, starting in January 95, started a group called Dianoga. And I was kind of doing all these weird, odd jobs, uh, you know, painting houses here and then building some cabinetry for a recording studio over there and, and then uh, doing a lot of freelance illustration. And one of the illustration jobs I got asked to do a drawing for a poster. Uh, my, f- my friend Andy Mueller was going to be laying out the text for this poster for um, Rocket from the Crypt, uh, the Wesley Willis fiasco, and Super Suckers. And uh, he asked me to do a drawing. Uh, he had some experience with screen printing because he worked in a t-shirt shop during high school, but I didn't know anything about screen printing. And we went and met up with a guy named Steve Walters who was going to be doing the printing for us. Steve uh, was, self-ta- was self-taught and uh, working out of this space on the third floor of a sort of a commercial building in Chicago. It was the kind of space where, you know, the roof leaked and there's missing panes of glass in the windows and um, sort of a bunch of young people working around the clock and uh, surviving on food from the corner store. Uh, the next room over was a small letterpress print shop called Fireproof Press that was making records for bands like Tortoise and Shellac. And, uh, and then Steve was the main energy behind Screwball Press, which was a screen printing shop that was basically like a bunch of used gear that had been found in dumpsters and pulled together with uh, web straps and, and uh, hardware store springs and stuff. And it was great. It was like completely homemade. Uh, and there was just printing there happening all the time. So Steve and I kind of hit it off over the course of about six months. I went from sort of a client to, you know, helping mop the floors and reclaim screens and eventually getting to print work, uh, for Steve, for other people, and eventually for myself. So kind of gradually eased into it. 
And how long did you stay there? So that was over the winter, 95 into 96. Um, printed there on and off full-time, 96, 97, 98. And he moved out of that space. Uh, last day was New Year's Eve, 98. Uh, at that point, I took some equipment that I'd acquired and uh, a pair, set of drying racks that I'd bought for cheap and dragged it all into the basement of my apartment building and started the bird machine in January 99 in a little space that was about 15 by 20 feet with a six foot ceiling. Uh, but I'm 6'3", so I'd hit my head on the ceiling about three times a day. And uh, yeah, so I just sort of carried that tradition as far as uh, doing things by hand, making your own equipment, and um, really kind of treating the print shop like a combination of a garage sale and a pirate ship. Steve's move to a new location was kind of a bit of the catalyst for you to uh, start out on your own, was it? Yeah, it, I think that was one of the things. Um, there was sort of an ever-changing group of people that were kind of coming and going out of the space. And so if you plan to go in and print, you know, at 10 o'clock on a Tuesday night, but Bob was on the press, you might have to wait until midnight or you might have to wait till one in the morning and, and somebody else had used the screen that you wanted. And so um, I, I had enough work that it seemed to be a good move to kind of get my own space. Your client list basically encapsulates what I would expect would be a full read through of any indie rock fans, like entire album catalog. <laughs> but just for folks who uh, might be listening, who don't know um, some of, or all of your clients, I just want to uh, indulge me for one second. I just want to read through some of the bands. So we've got The Flaming Lips, Jeff Tweedy, St. Vincent, Lowe, Shellac, Blonde Redhead, Jack White, Flight of the Concords, Nico Case, Mud Honey. Andrew Bird, Iron and Wine, Dinosaur Jr., Thurston Moore, The Decemberists, Sleater Kenny, Melvin's, Broken Social Scene, Fugazi, Sonic Youth, Arctic Monkeys, Built to Spill, Doves, Promise Ring, Hum, and The Shins. That just gets us <laughs> started. Your list goes on and on from there. Do you have any idea how many posters you've created over the years? Something over a thousand. Um, wow. It's one of the things we're figuring out right now, actually, this being the 25th anniversary of my um, having been making posters, I'm working on uh, an archive uh, website. So I've had some a lot of help this summer trying to enter data into the site and uh, trying to locate all sorts of old JPEGs of, of prints. Have you kept a copy of everything you've done? I have, actually, yeah. Yeah, it takes, <laughs> it takes up a lot of space. <laughs> the great thing with your setup is you're printing all of them yourself. A lot of the posters that I design, if I'm making them for a client, I end up, because of where I'm located, basically in St. John's, out in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, it just makes way more sense half the time for me to have someone else print them. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. But unfortunately, the thing that's, that's been bad about that is I don't always get copies. Ah. I can't say that I've got copies of everything I've made. I'm very, very jealous of your back catalog. Well, come, you can have some of mine. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> I've got a bunch of yours here already, and I'm All right. happy to have more, though. Well, thank you. When I look at band posters, there's kind of, there's two different kinds. There's uh, the ones that are used for advertising an event, you know, the ones that'll go up on telephone poles. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, a lot of times have all the specific details, including, you know, ticket info, but logos and all that. And then there's the merch poster, which is basically just sold at the merch table. And those ones are uh, the ones that people take home and frame and hang on the wall to kind of commemorate. Um, I know you do a lot of the latter uh, because I know that there's collectors all over the world that have them hung on their walls. Do you make many posters that are kind of the advertising style ones? I guess I've never really thought that there was a difference between the two. I think that the role of the poster has shifted in this time that I've been doing this sort of stuff. When I started, if you wanted to find out about the shows that were coming up, you would, um, you know, you'd pick up the, the local weekly free arts uh, newspaper that had all the gallery listings and the, the concerts at various venues. And you'd look for the ad for lounge acts or the empty bottle or things are happening at the Metro or Fireside Bowl or Shubas or um, the job of the poster at that point was, you know, to let you know that Silkworm was going to be coming to play at Lounge X on, you know, on Thursday the 14th. And so you'd make it and, and try and get these up, you know, at the coffee shop and the record store and the bookstore and try and get them up in the windows. And then those would, you know, undoubtedly get torn down at some point. And put in the bat, put in the the trash, or or end up on somebody's apartment wall. Um, I think that I've 
continued generally to approach making posters with the same way as far as having the information be the same. Um, but the role of the poster has, has changed in that back then, um, like it was um, advertising and it helped get people to the show. But people go to the show and they'd buy CDs and they'd buy T-shirts and records. Uh, now people go to the show and nobody's buying, not nobody, but the band can't count on record sale income as a substantial portion of their merchandise. So the poster has become like an event specific poster, uh, you know, playing Thursday the 12th in Chicago. Uh, that event specific poster has become more of a, a central um, source of income for the bands uh, as far as their merchandise income. I think that's part of what's shifted in the music business, but I don't know that that's necessarily changed the way that I approach a project when I sit down with my pencil and paper and get ready to start in on something. A lot of times I'll end up having to put a bunch of, you know, cheesy logos and extra information on the versions that are going to be going out for advertising. But yeah. I love being able to strip them down for the screen printed version and kind of just get down to the bare minimum of what needs to be there. Yeah. A couple of things that I've noticed about your posters uh, is they always seem to capture a moment of action. <laughs> So many posters are just kind of like a stat. It's just an image of a building or an image of a scene, whereas your posters really do kind of tell a whole tale of what's going on. And usually in that moment of action, there's always kind of a quiet humor. Um, is this action or humor something that you've always tried to incorporate or does it just happen naturally all the time? Um, I mean, I, uh, at this point, I'm just a sad used pile of dad jokes. But uh, historically, I like to think that I can occasionally say something funny and I I'd like to, uh, you know, I grew up looking at like the far side comics and the fact that there could just be one little action. It didn't even necessarily need text. Maybe it had a little text and you could find the punchline and it was always, you know, this really subtle, amazing sense of humor. Um, and I think that probably was an influence on these tiny narratives that I think I try to tell. Um, it, by tiny narrative, I mean, it might be just like, guy fell off of his chair or, you know, playing a horn at an inappropriate time. Yeah. I mean, I, I think to make something funny to entertain is, um, one of the sort of lower tier goals of, of what I try to do, I guess. Um, I think one of the things about that, that's, that might have been different about my work when I was getting into this is that I, a lot of the concert posters that I was seeing were, um, they seem to be like serious and, and, and like, you know, like tough guy imagery, uh, drug imagery, monsters, Dracula, hot rods, naked women. And, uh, that was not sort of the, that was just not stuff that was reflected in the kind of music that I was listening to and, uh, little, you know, some sort of little tongue in cheek joke, um, or, or just depiction of, everyday items recontextualized or something like that, that would, that was much more interesting for me. And, um, so I don't know, I'm just sort of saying a bunch of words at this point. Uh, no, that's <laughs> totally, it's interesting. Cause what you just said is exactly why your posters resonated with me in the first place. Cause I mean, this would be, we're talking, you know, late nineties, uh, very, very early two thousands, kind of like say right before the gig, gig posters.com thing happened. Mm hmm. And a lot of posters that were out were exactly what you just described. They were all hot rods. They were um, they're all skulls and lots of pinup girls and things like this. And like, you know, the amount of posters I remember from back in that era that had a scantily clad woman who also had a devil's tail and devil horns. Yeah. And uh, it was all just so kind of contrived and cheesy. Uh, it would just seem like mall punk to me. Like it was like, it's like we're badass, but we're not badass at all. And that's exactly why your stuff stood out so much to me in the beginning, because yours would just be like an animal on a skateboard one of the posters that I have is uh, St. Vincent one you did with a buffalo uh. <laughs> up on a balcony, like in an alleyway. So like the buffalo on the balcony in the alleyway on the side of this building is already kind of like a bit ridiculous and surreal enough on its own. And it makes her a beautiful image, but it's already kind of strange and odd. But then one of your bear characters is in the window below, hanging out the window with a hose, spraying the <laughs> buffalo in the face just to be like, I know your life sucks. You're on this balcony, but guess what? I'm also going to spray you. That to me, the absurdity of it, not to mention also one of my favorite artists, St. Vincent's like, yeah. there's so many levels of why 
I would want to own that poster. You know, <laughs> that's the kind of humor that you just weren't seeing in basically a girl with a devil tail. Well, I mean, the girl with the devil tail, that type of imagery was, uh, there was a place for that. You know, and Chris Cooper was, was making great work. Frank Kozik was making great work. Um, those guys were doing one sort of style of illustrative rock posters. And then you had this other school of like Art Chantry and Jeff Kleinsmith making uh, more des- sort of design oriented concert posters out in Seattle. Uh, Mike King uh, doing the same sort of thing. And that was, um, both of those were, that was all stuff that I, I saw and took in, but I guess I wanted to try and do, you know, get the same message across as that, you know, the, the, the naked devil girl sitting in the hot rod with Dracula or with Frankenstein's monster. I wanted to kind of get that same message across, but using like raccoons and a toaster and some broken chairs and see if we can, you know, convey the same sort of thing. I look at all this work kind of being created by different people. And I know that there's a million design decisions that could have been the ones that folk, folks went with for that particular problem or project. And I'm always wondering why that decision was made. So I know you've answered this question before, but I do think that listeners uh, who haven't heard it would find it extremely interesting. Why you made the design decision to go with using animals instead of people. Oh man. Well, that's, that has sort of slowly developed, um, over time. Looking back, I think I'm thinking now about my first 10 posters, maybe, uh, I think most of them had people in them like human people, but there were also drawings of animals. Um, in college, I'd done a lot of paintings. (laughs) There's a, there's a long story that your podcast doesn't have time for that involves, uh, how I sort of lowered my standards uh, representationally uh, in making paintings and trying to depict things and sort of went away from trying to depict things realistically and, and, and sort of simplified down. And I did a series of drawings and paintings that were basically pictures of Ottomans, like you might have in front of your couch. And then at some point, one of the Ottomans developed a butthole and a tail and, and then, uh, you know, at some point that became like a little squat little dog, got a head and got it, got some ears and became a lot and some teeth and became a dog or a cat or something at some point. Um, as things developed over time, uh, it became easy to anthropomorphize these animals, whether it's a bear or a squirrel or a sort of, a, as Steve Albini for, refers to them, undifferentiated mammals. They're just sort of, you know, it's a mammal, but you're not sure if it's like a wombat or a marmot, or a skunk, or a zebra, or what, you know, you don't know what it is exactly, but you're sure it's got fur. Ottomanosaurus. So something, yeah, Ottomanosaurus. Um, and what was I saying? Basically, uh, it became easier to have, as, as you mentioned a couple questions ago, the posters tend to be about action. They seem to be about, it's about crashing a bike. It's about falling off a chair. It's about um, reading a book in a tree. Um, and if you make the character that's doing that action, like a bear, then it sort of represents everybody. If you make it a person, then you have to be like, you have to make decisions about gender, uh, ethnicity, uh, clothing. Um, and each of those things represents different things to different people. Um, but if it's just a bear and like a cartoon bear who's, doing that thing, then like everybody can kind of project themselves into that and whatever they want, whatever they way they they would like to. Um, so that, that's something I realized sort of in hindsight, that's not a, that wasn't a conscious decision. I think it's super smart. I remember when I I first saw that, uh, you describe it that way, I thought it was so genius. And it's interesting because I, I did a poster for the Winnipeg Folk Fest a few years back. And um, I made all the characters on it uh, like a teal blue color. Mm-hmm. And I, I kind of drew, now they were people, but they were all this like bright teal blue. Mm-hmm. And uh, I remember one of the organizers uh, of the festival saying to me, uh, you know, why did you go with blue? Like, you know, like they, some, of, some of the folks on the board think the blue is a bit weird. And at that time, it was interesting because only about a month or two earlier, McLean's Magazine had listed... Uh, Winnipeg as the most racist city in Canada. <laughs> and so I remember just being like when I got hired to do this poster and we had all wanted to put these people in these various si- situations on these posters. And I was just like, well, I'm going to make them blue because 
I, you know, the, the city's already having its uh, its share of problems right now. We don't want to potentially like exasperate right. any of them. So that was kind of a quick little decision there. And um, But I think the bears and the cats would have been the perfect solution. Solves everything. Yeah, you put some pants on cats and uh, give them a cup of coffee and they can they can do everything that people can do. Uh, <laughs> it, it, like I said, it wasn't a conscious decision at the time. It, it was uh, more, I think, probably, I can't, I can't think of anything, any particular specific image, but it was probably more that it would be funny to have a dog riding a bike uh, and that's, or a cat riding a bike or something like that. Even though your posters are for music artists and for music tours or shows, you very rarely ever draw anything musical in your posters, like a guitar or a set of drums or anything like that. Do you listen to the band's music for coming up with ideas? Yeah. Most of the bands that I make posters for are bands that I listen to. Mm -hmm. Um, Either that I have sort of at least a good familiarity with, or more often they're like my favorite bands that I listen to all the time, like Andrew Bird or Hum or Shellac. And uh, yeah, I guess I I feel like, you know, if I'm drawing guitars or, or people holding microphones. I mean, it's like, well, you can just go look at a picture of the band if you want to see, yeah, yeah. see that. Um, another s- side of it is running the risk of getting the band wrong. You know, I, I saw at one point um, somebody had made a poster for Fugazi and they had drawn somebody jumping, playing a guitar, but the person jumping, playing the guitar had dreadlocks, uh, which is very distinctly not... Uh, not any of the characters, not any of the uh, sorry, characters, the, the band members of Fugazi. Mm-hmm. And I felt like, well, yes, you've got a guitar player there, but it has nothing to do with the band at all. Yeah. Um, I just kind of wanted to make sure that whatever other people see in the band that's being um, represented on the poster, um, that I'm not specifically getting something wrong as much as leaving things open to interpretation. And looking at some of your process, do you uh, then, like when you listen to the music, do you, will you present a couple of quick sketches or ideas to these bands? Uh, generally, no, because uh, budgets and schedules are not such that most of the time, basically, I'm not really willing to take <laughs> suggestions at this point. Um, I figure if I've got a thousand posters done, um, people come to me, they know sort of they should have a pretty good idea what to expect. Um, I do at this point, and my process has changed slightly over the years and I've made a lot of mistakes as far as relating to uh, customers, clients. But at this point, basically, you know, I'll ask a client, is there, do you have any particular thing you want to convey and give me all the text you need on here? Uh, I'll do a pencil drawing, scan that, um, and send it to him say, you know, did I spell the venue correctly? Have I got the right date? Uh, did you, did we remember the tagline of the production company or whatever? Um, and then at that point I'll, uh, either go to ink or just scan the pencil drawing in and, 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 uh, create layers in Photoshop. So I'm, I'm at this point sort of, um, I don't charge enough to be really open to a lot of, um, back and forth. Mm -hmm. Um, and trying to worry about whether, you know, the band likes, you know, they really want to have this particular color purple or whatever. Yeah. And you've got such a track record over the years that I'm sure people can just, uh, they know what, what, what you do and what you're going to deliver. I hope so. You mentioned a second ago that you use Photoshop for doing any layers. Have you, uh, moved at all to using Wacom's or iPad pros? Um, well, that's interesting. I, so starting back at the beginning, let me back up. 25 years. Um, When I started printing at Screwball, Screwball stood out as a place that was making films on photocopiers and uh, hand cutting films using Rubylith, which uh, had used to be a staple of the design and newspaper fields, Um, basically uh, hand cutting a photo stencil with X-Acto knives. And um, so a lot of lettering uh, images, uh, backgrounds were all cut into layers of plastic. And so that was something that I was really proud of doing, uh, manually for the next maybe decade after I started making posters. And I think a lot of people associate 
poster making that came, comes out of Screwball Press with cutting ruby lith. And I still do that periodically. Uh, starting around 2004, 2005, I learned to use Photoshop, which I'd not known before. So I could take a drawing and scan it in and then draw basically on my trackpad and create shapes of color that way. So I can draw the shape of the pants are blue and the shape of the shirt is yellow. And then those each of those layers gets printed out onto its own film. I tried using a Wacom tablet maybe for a little while, maybe in the early 2000s. And then more recently, maybe about three years ago, uh, my wife Diana uh, got an iPad Pro uh, for editing her illustration work. And it she went through two weeks of just absolutely hating it. And then suddenly it all clicked and it became <laughs> like the greatest tool for her. So she does all her work in gouache, does these beautiful paintings in gouache, and then scans them in. And then the book editor will say, well, this is great, but we need more leaves or the child's shirt should be blue instead of red. And instead of having to start her painting over, which is what she used to do, she can work in uh, Procreate and, um, and fix the image up that way. And you can't tell the difference at all wow. in the finished product. And it's amazing. I got an iPad Pro used from a friend, have done a little bit of that, but it has really, I'm sort of too stuck in my ways <laughs> yet. And I haven't had, uh, I haven't had like a, a big single reason to have to really have to have that two weeks of pain in the ass to, uh, really get really comfortable using that software at this point. So I'm still, uh, right now I'm sitting here in front of my eight year old, uh, MacBook pro little 13 inch MacBook pro, which I do everything on, including all my color separations on this trackpad. That's the size of a business card. So I'm a Luddite. I'm a digital Luddite in that sense. No, I'm right there with you. I draw all my, my drawings on the trackpad. Yeah. Wow. I do, uh, a lot of times I'll do a pencil sketch first and kind of get that approved with the client. And mm -hmm. then I scan the pencil sketch. And then in Illustrator, I draw over the pencil sketch, basically creating a vector version of it. But I do wow. all this with the trackpad. I also haven't switched to a uh, iPad Pro or anything like that yet. Although all the kids do seem to love them. Yep. Well, mine, mine got uh, swiped by my daughter to do, be able to do uh, e-learning uh, soon oh, after I got it. So, <laughs> um, so now it's the family uh, Zoom unit. And... Uh, it's used for, uh, I don't know what, Minecraft education and uh, various aspects of school. So I bought one a number of years ago and kept it. All I did, uh, did with it was read comic books. <laughs> but we gave it to uh, my fiance's mother and ah. she, uses, she uses it for everything. But yeah, I found I was only reading comic books on it and half the time I already had the physical copy. So I didn't even know why <laughs> I was doing that. I was like, I'm wasting, I'm wasting the experience of actually getting to flip those pages. So yeah. Well, you mentioned a minute ago or a couple of minutes ago about um, the fact that when you get information from the bands, you need them to send all the text up front. And that was another thing I wanted to ask you about was because over the years, uh, you've developed kind of your own type, like your own font, even though it's a totally hand drawn one and it does shift and change for every single poster. But uh, yeah, like you have created like your own typeface. If a band suddenly had to switch some text or something, that must be such a pain in the ass to do later on because where it is all hand drawn. Yeah, it is. I okay. So when I started making posters, I was laying text out uh, in Quark uh, on Andy Mueller's Mac, some Mac Tower he had. This would have been like ninety six, ninety seven, maybe. And and then I print them up, and I I take that paper print and go over to Kinko's. On, uh, on North Avenue and say hi to Chris Ware, who's at one machine, say hi to Wesley Willis, who's at another machine. And maybe somebody from the Handsome family was there. And, uh, and I'd sit and I'd copy the paper output from Quark uh, up or down, you know, uh, uh, embiggening it or shrinking it <laughs> to uh, try and get the right size film and then sort of compile things uh, with a bunch of tape. Uh, compile segments of film with a bunch of tape and, and Ruby lith to try and get finished films somewhere in there. I started drawing hand drawing text as well. And somewhere early on I had, I lucked into having a show with art Chantry famous, you know, eighties and nineties, uh, graphic designer in Seattle. 
uh, a true student of design and a wonderfully curmudgeon old guy at this point who <laughs> knows most of design history. And uh, so Art basically said, man, this hand-drawn text you're doing is really good and your, your digital type is just terrible. Um, you should just stick with the hand-drawn type. So my hand-drawn type was heavily influenced by a German printmaker who had been active in the 70s, 80s, and into the early 90s named Horst Janssen, who made etchings outside of uh, Hamburg, uh, I think in Oldenburg. And uh, his etchings were all like these very dark uh, etchings of like rotting wood and dead flowers and, and various pieces of roadkill he'd find on the road. And that was interesting, but And oh, I'm sorry. And also historical portraits. He did amazing portraits of uh, historical figures. But um, that was that work was really good. But the thing that really grabbed me was the posters that he would make for his shows of his prints. He would make these these posters with all this hand done lettering, and that definitely had an influence on me because it looked it was like a really blocky, heavy, geometric um, version of like. Like the kind of hand painted sign you'd see at a grocery store, it was somewhere between calligraphy uh-huh. and like the kind of sign you'd see advertising cantaloupes for sixty nine cents, and uh, and then that superimposed on like you know a, a stretched out dead you know pelt of a dead rabbit that's been in the sun for two weeks. It really grabbed my interest, sort of about as I was finishing school and as I was getting into poster making. But uh, that was a heavy influence as far as the way that I've arranged my typography. And then from that, it's uh, just sort of slowly developed over time. Yeah, I really like it. And it's interesting to me that it also like these kind of typefaces, because you have the one that's kind of the outline type, the kind of blockier outline. And then you have the uh, the thinner font uh, that you're using for more kind of like subtext and that. But what I've been blown away at is when you look at all the different posters and all the different bands, that typeface that you've kind of created works every time. Uh, and it's kind of it's cool that it works with like the punk bands the you know the the post punk bands and then the math rock bands and the indie rock bands and the folk artists and it kind of works in every instance i've always really loved it and i'm glad i got to finally ask you about it well thank you i think it's also like influenced by the 5 years of technical drawing that i studied you know i did 4 years of drafting in high school and then into industrial design in college and um just sort of uh the fact that i have this background of of laying things out with rulers and and centering things and uh, working with these nice arcs and then knowing that stuff and then completely not using rulers and, uh, and making things a little bit crooked or drawing italicized text is, I really enjoy that, that part of the process. So it's, the text is not like an afterthought that gets set on top of the image or below the image. It's, it's usually where I start. And, and spiral in from the text into the into the image if the text is not actually in the actual picture itself. Do you ever um, have a poke around on eBay and type in your own name and see uh, what people are selling your posters for? I occasionally have somebody ask me, hey, is this actually yours or is this legit or is this a reprint or, you know, and they'll send me links. Um, I don't browse eBay recreationally for, of, for my own work, but... Um, You know, sometimes I'll have somebody ask for an older print, maybe out of my personal archive, and uh, I kind of want to make sure that I'm giving them a price that's uh, representative of the the current market for that print. So, uh, so don't don't end up selling somebody something for thirty dollars that they're going to turn around and put on eBay for five hundred. Yeah. The reason I asked was because I, uh, I mean, I do end up looking from time to time because there's uh, yourself and a couple other. Uh, poster artists that I love that there are a few back catalog posters that I would love to uh, find someday. And uh, it always blows my mind. Like your stuff uh, is like, yeah, I mean, starting at around $75, but going up, I mean, there's just pieces on there even today that were $750 and up. Oh man. And uh, yeah, it's quite amazing. Um, I'm going to have to go look that up and see, I'm going to have to go see what that is. Pull one of those out. Yeah, exactly. Put a couple up for 700 now. Undercut that uh, aftermarket. Yeah. The coolest thing, I was thinking about this the other day. One time, one time, I got some mail. And this is probably 15 years ago. But I got some mail and uh, it was a check and came with a letter. And uh, the guy said, I bought this print from you X number of years ago. 
uh, you know, for $20 or $30. And, uh, I decided I need, I wanted to pass it on, but I just sold it for $700 and it seemed weird that you didn't get any of that. So here's a hundred dollars. I was like, <laughs> I was like <laughs> that was like the cool, <laughs> the coolest thing. Uh, that is, that's not really the coolest thing that's ever happened, but it was a pretty cool thing. Cause I'm still thinking about it 15 years later. So, well, it's funny because when you were telling that story, I was thinking that he was going to have given you like $680. <laughs> Here's your change. <laughs> you know what? You deserve this more than me. You should have the money. So when oh, you said a no. hundred dollars, I almost fell out of my chair then because oh. I was assuming the great grand gesture was going to be giving you all of the money. Oh, that would be, that's too much. So, yeah. I want to talk about album designs for a moment, because um, yeah, you have designed uh, quite a few record jackets as well, correct? Uh, some. I don't, I don't know that I've done a lot. I'm trying to look over my shoulder here at, uh, at some LPs I've got stacked on a shelf over here. I see sleeves for a bunch of different Andrew Bird records. I see a shellac record. I see a Steve Albini movie soundtrack. Uh, I see a record for the band The Fruit Bats. Um, did one for an English band called I Am Clute and, uh, I'm trying to think of what else I've got here. Yeah. And a bunch of my friends' bands. Um, I I'd say that's a, a more sort of a smaller fraction of, of my work, but, but yeah, I, um, I know my way around, <laughs> uh, messing up somebody's record. <laughs> well, and tell me a little bit about the reissues you did. Cause I know you did reissues for Andrew Bird and Archers of Loaf where you got to reinterpret oh, yeah. the work. Um, yeah, so let's see. Uh, Andrew, this thing, the one that comes to mind. You know, hold on one second because I'm going to walk like here. This is the part you can edit out the next five seconds. I have to put my headphones down. That's the sound of your feet going click, click, click across the floor. Click, click, click. It's a big room, everybody. He's got to walk a really long ways. Click, 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 down over the stairs. Click, 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 click. Oh, down the record and back. I grab. Are you still here? Sure am. All right, great. Uh, yeah, I just grabbed a handful. Um, yeah, one of the fun things I got to do was um, reinterpret uh, a record for Andrew Bird. Um, he he had. Uh, let's see, Andrew Bird's Bull of Fire had a record that came out call around 2000 uh, called The Swimming Hour, and it was only released at that point on CD. So. The record label went under. The CD art was only prepped for CD size manufacturing, and the original art was lost. And roughly 15 years later, they wanted to reissue the record on LP. So basically, um, you know, got a copy of the CD and and sort of redrew it uh, with sort of extrapolating from the starting point of the existing artwork. So the original photo on the original version of the album was portrait of Andrew sort of standing in a garden, with some trees in the background. And so I got to draw Andrew and then sort of changed the garden to a bunch of weird fish. And like, I don't even know what this thing is, some sort of weird uh, bush animal. And then the trees are all hands in the background and um, sort of re- reinterpreted each of the, the photos from inside the booklet and drew those all with a little bit of absurdity mixed in or turned up. So that was, a, that was a fun one to do. I got to do a similar thing for Archers of Loaf for their record Vivi, uh, which had a young woman on the hood of a car in an, some sort of alley, with some brickwork. They wanted to reissue that. Um, I think it was remastered and, and they wanted to do that as an LP. And I got to do the same thing, basically redraw that same cover, subject wise, color wise, everything's the same, but it's just a little bit, it's a little bit different. I rewatched uh, just like being there today the the film about uh, flat stock and uh, kind of poster culture that came out came out a number of years back and um, I just found myself just laughing hysterically at uh, the line of Eric Bachman from uh, Archers of Loaf when he says that Jay has the wonderful gift of being pause not annoying. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, yeah I. Um yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> he's one of the few people who holds that, that opinion of me. So, um, <laughs> that's, uh, I'm, I'm very fortunate. <laughs> the film kind of reminded me obviously of flat stock itself. I was blown away also, uh, to learn cause I only, my, um, fiance told this, mentioned this to me yesterday when I told her that we were going to be talking that she was like, ask him about flat stock. 
Ah. Like, I was just like, okay, sure. Cause I was thinking about you having a booth at Flatstock. Mm-hmm. And then she was like, no, no, he's one of the people who started Flatstock. That is also true. Wow. Tell me about that. All right. So I think this merits, merits having to tell the entire story of gigposters.com. When I started making posters, I was working with a half dozen other screen printers in Screwball Press. And we kind of knew there was somebody named Kozik making work in Austin. And we knew there was Art Chantry and Mike King working in the Northwest. Uh, But we didn't know these guys. We didn't know what they're working on now. We'd see posters they'd made in magazines. Occasionally, somebody would come in from one they'd gotten at a concert or something. And then, but, but the thing that is crazy, even to my old brain at this point is like, that was the mid nineties, which was before actual people used the internet. I mean, sure. Some people use the internet, but it wasn't like a wide, it wasn't as widely acceptable as accessible as it is now. So, so we started having, we started having shows in Chicago at the butcher shop gallery in the late nineties. I want to say like 99. And it was basically every poster maker that we New and we could think of um, everybody in Chicago, people from the Crosshair um, group of poster makers and Screwball Press and, and some Letter Press people and and uh, Chris Ware, and Archer Pruitt were in that show. And let's see, around 2000, uh, a Canadian guy from Calgary named Clayton Hayes started a fan page to show the collect the posters he'd collected by. A Los Angeles poster maker named Mike Fisher is my understanding of how it worked. Um, Mike Fisher made posters under the name Maximum Fluoride. Okay, so Clay started gigposters.com as sort of a fan page. And it, around 2000, it really quickly developed into sort of a collector, uh, a collection of poster makers getting on there to talk about their work, show what they were working on, um, interact with each other, solve problems, find out what bands were touring. And pretty early on, I got unsolicited emails from a guy named Jeff Pivato and another one from Alan Lord, who was in Winnipeg, Jeff Pivato in Austin, Alan Lord in Winnipeg saying, hey, your work is up on this site. You should come check it out. And I was like, ah, I don't know. I don't know about websites. I'm not interested. And, and then uh, I joined and um, suddenly met all these poster makers from around the country and around the world who are all basically doing the same sort of concert posters for the same sorts of bands. You know, everybody's making a Melvin's poster. Everybody's making posters for, um, you know, I can't even think of who's what's going on at that point. But, um, and we, you know, so like, as I've said, like anytime you get a big collection of nerds together, you have to have a, start having conventions. So, um, <laughs> fall of 2002, uh, Frank Kozik rented an art space in San Francisco and said, okay, you know, we got room for 30 tables. If you can make it there, the tables cost a hundred bucks, uh, bring your posters, show up on Friday, you know, and, uh, this is September of 2002. Um, I hopped on a plane, uh, rolled my posters up, stuck them in tubes, put my tubes into a duffel bag and, uh, didn't bring a change of clothes and flew out to San Francisco for the weekend to, hang out with a group of people I'd never met in real life, wow. which was sort of new territory for me. And we had a blast. And so this was Flatstock uh, was the, the name, um, which is a pun on playing off of Woodstock and the name of unprinted paper sitting mm-hmm. on the shelf. Um, so, uh, so that was the first one. I'm sorry, I'm going on a long winded thing here, but that was the first one. It worked out pretty well. Uh, Kozik said basically, hey, this worked out well, but I don't want to try and drive one of these by myself. I'm going to form a nonprofit called the American Poster Institute. The board is going to be these, I don't I think it was seven people. uh, And we should try and do more of these. So six months later, we had another one of these uh, mainly orchestrated by Jeff Pivato at South by Southwest in Austin. Six months after that, uh, Jeff Kleinsmith maneuvered us into the food court at Bumbershoot Music Festival in Seattle, right under the Space Needle. Um, again, six months later, back in Austin, back in Seattle, and then decided to try and expand into the uh, the Pitchfork, the brand new Pitchfork Music Festival in Chicago. And then from there into the Reaperbahn Music Festival in Hamburg. And um, so I was vice president of the organization for 
let's say from 2002 to 2007 and stepped back at that point. Once our daughter was born in 2011, my uh, choosing to travel for those things has kind of really diminished. Um, so I, I go to relatively few of the flat stocks anymore. Um, but uh, they're still going on. They happen in Austin, uh, which I do go to. They happen at uh, Primavera Festival in uh, Spain, uh, happen at the Reaper Bon. And uh, it's a great thing. So because I think when we started, people would kind of wander in and like, what is this stuff? And, you know, why, what are you doing here? What is this stuff? Why does that say my friend, my, my, my favorite band's name on this poster? What's it for? We had to kind of explain it where at this point, whereas now it's uh, like very much a known entity and you've got these kids who come in feeling like poster maker is a viable career choice because they've seen this work in front of them for, you know, 15 years or so. Well, yeah, I'd say there's people who travel to South by Southwest, even with all the music and all the films that are happening down there, they probably go there. There's also a crew that would be going there specifically for Flatstock. I've been kicking myself because I attended Flatstock. I actually performed at it with my old band multiple times in the 2000s um, at South by Southwest. Sorry, I performed okay. at, at that festival. I had no idea Flatstock existed. I just, I guess I wasn't reading the program or paying attention. And I would go down there, just play my show, go see a bunch of other bands and then leave. And it wasn't until I had quit playing in that band and moved back to Newfoundland that a friend of mine was like, we were talking about South by Southwest. And she was like, she's like, oh, you must have had so much fun going to Flatstock every year. <laughs> and I was just like, what do you mean? And I, at that point, I knew Flatstock existed, but I didn't know it had been part of South by Southwest the years that I had been there. I thought it was yeah. newer. And she was like, oh, yeah, it started back in like 2002 or 2003. And I was just like, what? It's, that means <laughs> it happened while I was there. And I just didn't bother going. And then seeing, looking at seeing all the names, you know, yourself and all the other people that were there and just being like, man, all my kind of like poster heroes were there in the same town I was with all their posters, probably the ones that I'm like searching around trying to find now were all there at that time. And I've been kicking myself ever since. Well, don't kick yourself because it's still going on. I'm less likely to be there than I used to be. But uh, man, that's a good time. It's, uh, it's great to see all the different people from around the world who are showing their work. Uh, so Flatstock, let's back up again. Um, the premise of the, the show was no dealers, no resellers. It's the actual poster artist uh, on the other side of the table. So if you're looking at, um, you know, it's either the people who've printed the posters or the people who've designed the posters or both. And it's got to be concert posters. So uh, art prints sort of posters without text uh, are a fraction of the the content, but it's, you're not going to see, um, you know, sports posters or, mm -hmm. or uh, mass produced, you know, kittens hanging from trees or whatever just like uh <laughs> hang in there uh i've, I've, I've got that one yeah. <laughs> um it's uh you know it's if you want to go and shop for melvin's posters or you want to go see uh look for uh, i can't even think of what like my morning jacket posters i mean if they've been touring and you're going to walk around you can see 15 different people who've been hired to make posters for for those bands yeah someday i hope to get down and uh yeah but um, let's jump one second now out of music. I also see that you've created a bunch of really cool movie posters uh, mm. for Ferris Bueller's Day Off, Moonrise Kingdom, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, and a whole bunch more. What's the story behind those? Yeah. So there's, um, let's see, there was an, a theater in Austin called the Alamo Draft House Theater Cinema. Um, originally, what they were doing was making special event screenings of classic movies. And so they'd say, you know, well, on, uh, on Friday, we're going to be screening Jaws or we're going to be showing um, Night of the Living Dead or, or 2001. And, uh, you know, let's make an event of it. And let's, let's get posters made to advertise this thing. So they'd, they'd arrange for the rights to be able to depict, you know, the movie in poster form for this one event. And uh, they hired poster makers to make those things. Uh, one of their side projects was they did something called the Rolling Road Show, where they took um, they took a portable movie screen and projector out on tour around the country and screened geographically based movies at the places where they took place or where they were filmed. So, for example, uh, they showed uh, North by Northwest on an airstrip in Bakersfield, California. 
they showed uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind at the base of Devil's Tower. Um, mm. They showed uh, one that, a couple that I got to make posters for, they showed um, Ferris Bueller's Day Off at the base of the Water Tower that's shown in the movie that's been painted Save Ferris. Huh. In the movie. So <laughs> that's in Northbrook, Illinois, which is about maybe 10 miles from where I'm at right now. And so they set up their screen at the base of that and uh, showed Ferris Bueller's Day Off there. They did a Christmas story at the house where it was filmed in Cleveland or Cincinnati, Cleveland. So fun. So, yeah. Um, Okay. So that was sort of how they started. And then there's a business split that I don't exactly understand or can't go into here, but Basically, part of the business spun off and became a separate entity called Mondo, which continued to gain the rights to movies for the purpose of um, making posters for uh, both new movies and old uh, intellectual property. So um, every film that's been ever been screened, uh, they do a great job of commissioning some really great poster makers to uh, design posters, uh, which are highly sought after. Um, and then they do things like You know, Judd, I know what you've been looking for. You've been looking for a double gatefold LP of the soundtrack to the Elf TV show from the 80s. (laughs) Yes. Uh, Well, (laughs) thankfully, they've got uh, a foil stamped cover uh, illustrated uh, beautifully gatefold double LP um, on, uh, on clear vinyl. Uh, for the entire soundtrack of of seasons one and two of Alf, I'm being sarcastic here, but it's it's they do these amazing intricate projects, um, you know, of soundtracks of of uh, old movies, and and uh, they also work on new stuff as well. Yeah, and they're all it's I know it's all like Mondo stuff is all fully licensed with the actual yeah. you know the proprietary owners of the movies and the movie houses and all that. So these movie posters you made were essentially predecessors to what Mondo became. Um, to some degree, to some, I mean, it's all the same people. I, uh, well, uh, there's been a natural flow of, of people being in, in the management and, and, and flowing out. But, um, but yeah, it's generally the same entity uh, as, wow. as I understand it, um, who's continuing to work now. So, oh, that's um, so cool. yeah. And so, uh, yeah, it's really, it's really kind of spun off into its own subculture apart from, the rock concert subculture. There's a, the Venn diagram has a a lot of overlap, but um, there's a a lot of distinct separation as well. Wow. Yeah. That's pretty cool. I mean, it's, it's interesting because I say I only learned about your involvement in helping kind of spawn um, flat stock there yesterday. Say now hearing this about Mondo, it's pretty amazing. Um, So I got a question here now with most artists, I can usually pick a favorite piece, (laughs) but I do find it impossible with your catalog because I, there's actually just like so many great ones and they all kind of like tie in so well together. So I find it almost, almost impossible. So I ask you if the museum of modern art in New York came calling and asked you to submit one piece of work for their permanent collection, do you know which one you would pick? Mm, wow. That's, you know, it's, that's one of those questions like which of your children do you love? <laughs> um, I've got a bunch that I sort of cringe at when I, I look at, but generally I like most of the work, which is a really boring answer. I feel like it's the right one with your work because I wouldn't be able to pick one. Like in my own catalog, if someone asked me that question, I, I can go straight to the one because in I feel like in my work, there is one piece that does stand above the others. And yeah. I've been trying for the last, I mean, it made it probably three or four years ago. And I've been trying for three or four years to beat it. And every time I make something new or look back at my last year's worth of work, I'm like, nope. <laughs> you know, it's, do you like pizza or ice cream? Well, I like pizza and it, but, um, I don't know if, if I had to pick one, I don't, God, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. I have an easier time picking 50. <laughs> you don't have to pick. It was, it was, a, it was a silly question that I didn't no, actually expect to I answer. Don't know. Let's, uh, okay. I think one that was sort of, sort of a landmark, not the landmark, but a landmark that I like a lot was uh, a poster I made for Fugazi and Shellac in 1998. And it's a yellow background. It's got five dogs and it's, they're just, I was frankly uh, overwhelmed by having to come up with an image for two of my very favorite bands, both of which are very sort of opinionated in their own aesthetics and um, their own um, 
ethics and they're both and they're not the same band. They're very much very distinct from one another, but they're friends and they play shows together and appeal to the same audience. And I just I couldn't like what what do you do graphically that's going to have anything to do with these two bands together? Well, I just ended up drawing some dogs and um, just just a handful of goofy looking dogs of different breeds. And uh, one of them was sort of facing away and his tail is up. And I was like, oh, you know what? Let's go back to the Ottoman days. Let's put a little butthole on here. <laughs> that, that poster is one of my favorite ones. It actually is one of the ones that I scour the web looking for from time to time. And, you know, one day I may end up with a copy of that. The butt is not like central to the theme of the image. It's just, it's more like you can look at it for a while before you notice that that's there. But, but yeah, that was, I mean, it was fun. I associate that with a time in my life and, and like hand pulled them all. I think I made something like 300 of them um, and uh, hand pulled all the layers except for the text. And uh, it was coming down to a deadline because I was going to go fly to Seattle to go see my friend out there. And so I ended up pulling everything except the text. So these complete images of these dogs. And I was like, okay, well, I'm not really sure how to do this text. I'll just, I'm just going to print the text down on like something, I don't know, like 15 or 20 of them to drop off at the promoter. And then I'm going to leave town for a week or two. And then when I get back, that's when I'll print the rest of them. And in that time while I was gone, I changed my mind about the color of the text. But I went to Seattle, ended up in a yoga class with Chris Novoselic. It was weird. Uh, And uh, just had like a very memorable trip. And then I came back home and finished up these posters and went over to this rock show to see my favorite two bands and sold posters for $5 a piece. So, oh, wow. and I heard you kept one of those posters. You didn't put any text on, right? Yeah, actually, I, well, I don't know where you, that's weird that you know that that's weird. <laughs> uh, yeah, I actually do have one of those. That's just the dogs, uh, with no text. That's great. I love it. Well, uh, Jay, you and Diana have carved out quite an amazing life. Myself and art lovers all over the world are like, say, scouring the web, trying to find your dogs with buttholes. <laughs> I know it's late there. Uh, we say we, for folks at home, we didn't start this interview until 830 at night, um, Chicago time. So it's, it's getting late. You got to get home to your family. And thank you so much for spending some of your time with me today. It's been a super highlight for me. Oh, well, thank you very much. I appreciate your interest. It's a pleasure to talk to you. And uh, I hope that I have not been too obscure in my, uh, in my mumblings. No, I've loved every second of it. And I'm sure other folks will too. Well, thank you very much. Oh, oh, holy hell. That was fun. I'm still buzzing. Can't believe that Jay Ryan has been at the forefront of pretty much everything that has made poster art the juggernaut art form that it is today. The fact that he helped spawn Flatstock was already impressive. I was super blown away by that. But to have also been there at the earliest days of what led to Mondo posters? <laughs> Man, just incredible. Yeah, I'm totally mind blown. Still can't believe it. I'm so honored you came on. His handmade type, use of action-packed animals, and hilarious visual voice have all helped Jay cement his place in history among poster artists. What is most incredible is that Jay has lived his entire life in one postal cult. The fact that he has had a global impact on both the music industry and the art world while only moving a couple miles from his childhood home is a testament to how far talent and hard work can really take you. If you want to learn more about Jay, his website is thebirdmachine.com where he has an online store where you can buy all sorts of his prints. His Instagram is at the bird machine, and you can find him on Facebook at actual bird machine. I learned a ton from our chat and hope you did too. I'm so happy. He was open to talk about his process and loved hearing how he does what he does. His point about essentially doing what he wants when it comes to the direction and concepts of his posters and not taking input from the bands because the budgets aren't high enough to warrant all that back and forth is a really good one. How many times over the years have I had bands or managers drive me crazy trying to art direct every little aspect of what I'm doing, usually pushing me to create work that's so far out of my own wheelhouse that it barely looks like my hand had anything to do with it in the first place. And let's get real, probably for next to no money. I do think it's an important point to make. Bands should allow their creatives to do what they do. You handle the songwriting and let your visual artists do what they've spent their whole lives learning to do. You'll get much more inspired work out of them if they're creating work that they're passionate about, rather than just being pixel pushers. 
Not saying there isn't room for collaboration. Of course, there always is. But if you're hiring one of the top artists in the world, like someone at Jay's level, whether that be for music video direction, album cover design, or posters, then maybe you should listen to what the pros have to offer and not assume that you know better. If you'd like to ask Jay a question, have a comment about this episode, a show suggestion, or anything else, send us an email at artdesignmusicpodcast at gmail.com. Be sure to give us your name and where you're from so we can enter you in our contest. And speaking of our contest, I have a copy of Jay's art print called Here Comes a Riff, which features a rabbit sitting in a chair, playing guitar, riding on top of a giraffe. It's pretty, pretty awesome. I actually liked it so much, I bought a copy for myself and then I bought a second one to give away. It's four screens signed and numbered by Jay himself. I'll give it away to either one of the people who writes in about this episode or to someone following at Art Design Music Podcast on either Facebook or Instagram. The winner will be announced on episode 11. So if you follow our Instagram and Facebook, that is like having two entries in for the poster. And if you send in a question or a comment on top of following our social media, then that is like having three entries. As always, I want to thank drummer Lowell Campbell for taking the time to perform and record all the beats you heard in this and every episode of this podcast. The first time Lowell and I ever hung out was oddly enough because of graphic design. He was fresh out of high school and I was the new kid in town having just moved to Nova Scotia. I'll save that story for another time, but you should check out Lowell's band Wintersleep at wintersleep.com. And while I'm pushing websites, I should mention that we made some fun podcast merch. I had a look at all the ways you make money from podcasts and they're cheesy as hell. In an effort to avoid having to put ads for manscaping in this thing, I thought I'd take a shot at printing some t-shirts, enamel pins, stickers, and beanies. They all say art, design, music, but don't say podcast anywhere for those of you that feel you're too cool to wear a shirt promoting a podcast. I'm in that club. So if you're a fan of art, design, and or music, then maybe you'll enjoy wearing one of these shirts or pins. Pop over to artdesignmusic.com and click on the merch button to have a look. If you enjoyed today's chat with Jay Ryan, then I think you're also going to love episodes eight and nine, where I'll be talking to illustrators Hayden Menzies and Drew Millward. Hayden is Canadian and Drew is from England. Both are incredible artists doing great work for iconic bands. I can't wait to hear about their exciting adventures as I know I'm going to learn a ton from them both. Next episode, however, we're taking a totally different direction and I know you're going to love it. Jeanette Beckman's photographs have helped tell the story of many of the world's biggest bands. If you're a fan of the late 70s British punk scene, 80s New York hip hop, or more chart topping groups like the B-52s, Blondie, The Police, or Tracy Chapman, then this episode is going to be your jam. Jeanette's journey has taken her camera to glamorous, exciting, and surprisingly dangerous locations. Her stories are incredible. She's incredible. She's super knowledgeable and really, really hilarious. You're going to love it. I can guarantee you this episode is one that's going to appeal to everybody. Please, 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 please subscribe wherever you get your podcast. Make sure you don't miss this one. Jeanette is amazing and I don't want you to miss it. Once again, I'm graphic designer and illustrator Judd Haynes, and this has been episode three of Art Design Music.